So next up, we're going to talk about no more networking. We're going to talk about network communication. Yay. This is where I have fun. I'm, a, I'm more of a, not more of, but I'm, I'm a networking guy at heart. I like dealing with packet capture and stuff. So when I have malware that does network communication, that makes me happy. Um, so there's, there's all different reasons why a particular executable malware or otherwise will want to do network communication. Um, there's certainly there there's the reconnaissance phase um, where the attacker is gathering information, doing, you know, Google searches on the target to, to try to gather email addresses. Maybe they've developed some tool to automate that. And so if you're analyzing, you get a hold of that executable and you see some, you know, web-based uh, interaction, um, being able to, to understand what's going on there. Um, what else? Ink sweeps, port scanning. This is old school stuff. Don't see a lot of that. Um, well, that's not entirely true. The port scanning uh, on a on an open, not open, on an internet connected um, system, uh, you'll still see a bunch of port scanning looking for vulnerable services. Um, open mail relay scanning, that's fun. You'd think by now we would have figured that one out, but nope, there's lots of open mail relays out there. Don't tell the bad guy. Um, Email communication testing. Um, if they're automating uh, perhaps some of their their phishing or spear phishing tools, could uh, could see that social media analysis. So a big thing. You know, gather all the Twitter messages. Sometimes. Um, there's also the exploit delivery phase, which I the, the email also would fall into here, but. We talk about your um, server-based exploitation versus client side, um, where you're actually going after a, a service that's running you know, with an open port, um, or, or maybe a, at the uh, higher level application level, um, SQL injection. Or there's a tool that they use for, like I said, they're, they're sending out their emails, their phishing emails. Um, drive-by downloads sometimes. Um, and then there's the command and control phase and the packet capture analysis course that Reed had gone over um, went a bit into this from the packet capture side. We're going to talk about this from a uh, reverse engineering perspective now. Um, TCP or UDP, maybe IPv6, so oh, crazy. Um, HTTP or HTTPS, so are they using SSL? Um, how, what's one way we could try to figure out if SSL is being used in a binary? Crypto analyzer plugin. Crypto analyzer PID, yay. It's a useful tool. Um, is is the is the C two being tunneled over email? Crazy over DNS. Look up uh, Dan Kaminsky if you want to see everything over DNS. Um, over instant messenger. Be interesting. One of the the main things with all of these is looking for the API calls that signal network communication. Um, for those who are familiar with with programming in C, we're talking your 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 socket, your connect, your send, receive, um, that stuff from a, a higher level uh, Windows programming perspective. There's plenty of other library calls that that can be made. Um, we'll we'll get into those shortly. Um, yeah, my, my background is, or, or what I tend to deal with, is more on the command and control side. That's what you tend to, to see the you know, spearfish get sent in or drive by download. Malware executes on your internal network and it needs a way of communicating out. So if 
from an hour difference perspective, that's that's see a lot of of that. So can I kind of focus on that? Okay. Finding the code. Isn't dynamic analysis easier if we just want to find out what it's doing on the network? Maybe. Or maybe it has a sleep in there and it waits like an hour before it actually does anything on the network and your automated sandboxing tool only gives it like three minutes. Or maybe it waits three and a half minutes and, you know. Um, well, it's not like that. Your malware is going to be very stateful, right? You can't necessarily, I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to fuzz it to find out what, what all the branches and procedure protocol are before you can look at the code. Right, right. Um, and even when you do get, as, as you're saying, even when you do get the initial callback possibly, that may not be enough information to do full-on detection on, on your network. You might still have to dive into the code to figure out what else is it doing to reconstruct what might that network communication look like. Okay. So, we, uh, those of us here in McLean, now have our lovely practical malware analysis by Sikorsky and Honig um, book here. It's it's a really good book. When when Matt and I were first designing this course last year, um, we were like, there aren't any good books out there that that have really like hands-on examples of this is this is the kind of you know like thing you look for at a high level, and this is what that translates to in you know assembly code. And then that book came out as we were putting together the course content, and that is exactly what the book is doing. So definitely a, a good book. Um, take a look at it. They've got more examples in there than uh, what we're doing here, so definitely worth um, reading through as well as for uh, for reference. Just a little spiel on that. Um, the uh, the table 14-5, the, for the folks online, you'll be able to, um, when you come across a um, API in the assembly that you're not sure what it's doing or you need to look up the um, what the parameters are that it takes, you can um, do a Google search on that. Um, actually, there's, there's enough people here in the class who have um, their laptops with them that that'll actually be useful for you as well. And if you could maybe help out the people who don't who didn't bring a laptop and, and let them uh, uh, do a quick look up on your uh, Google's access there, that'd be useful. Um, but if for those of us who do have the book, take a quick look at 313. Page 313, there's table 14-5, there's a bunch of different um, uh, WinSock API, WinINet API, and COM interface. Uh, just some some of the ones to be aware of that I mentioned in there: the the connect and the socket stuff, your standard stuff, and the uh, the internet, um, the internet open, internet open URL. Um, these are these are things that you might see in there. A lot of times, what you'll be able to do is just go to the Imports, assuming you have a proper imports table, and go, okay, what's what's being imported, and, and see what catches your eye for network communication. So, Drew, how did you figure out that it's using Internet Explorer? MSDN. MSDN, that's the answer I was looking for. If you, if you look up what is it, URL? Download to cache file. Download to cache file. If you look that up in MSDN, you'll say, well, you know, downloads data to the internet cache. And what it'll say, what is it in here? Um, it uses Internet Explorer to do it for you. So the, I, I thought this was a good example to show um, that the whole look for a you know, unique user agent string as a way of detection, which those are who are maybe from the, the networking side of, of network defense will know, you know, 
a lot of malware uses a specific user agent string, and you can um, detect the malware based on that or just look for a weird user agent string. Well, not when your malware is actually saying to IE, hey, you, go go get this file for me or do, do my comms for me because then the user agent string will look like the actual browser on the system just like everybody else's. So just be aware of, of how the, the different API calls that uh, malware will use affect how that um, how it's going to look in network communications. All right, MBA implant. So, which API functions are used to send and receive? Combine one and two. Which ones did you come up with? Yeah, the send from WS232 library being used. If we initially just take a look, I'll let it analyze. If we initially only take a look at the imports, maximize that. Oh, and I turned off the little magnifying thing. If we take a look at the, the imports here, we take a look through the, that's interesting, that's interesting, kernel 32 stuff, some user 32 stuff, WSA socket, and we start to see the WS232 library. We have send to, receive, send. Those are being used. If we were to just look at the the imports, that's what we would see. It will pull out the function. There we go. <coughs> However, there is also, where is that? Oh, library, get for our address. Whenever you see those, not necessarily mean something is up, but it's usually worth taking a look at where that's being called. If we take a look at that, it's being called in a few different places. Oh, hey, that first one. Win inet.dll. Get proc address, internet open A, internet open URL, internet read file. So just be aware that the imports table, um, the imports table lies. No, uh, the imports table can be very useful, but, but make sure that you look for that load library as well and just check it out. Uh, take a look at the call to receive. Okay, let's do that. If we go back to imports and we take a look at receive, there's just the one call to it. And we take a look at this. Okay, there's receive call. What can we say about this? Call to receive about the about the packets that it receives. What are the arguments to receive? So, those, any one of those, we expect being 11, 12. Oh, that popped away too quickly. They're only expecting 112 byte packets. 
So they're either expecting one uh, It's doing a switch jump based on some off-coded reason. Yes, Corey. We'll get there. Uh, they're only expecting one 12 byte packet. Um, or they're at least handling it in one 12 byte chunks. Maybe they are only sending things in one 12 byte packets. Maybe that's a, a anomaly that you can look for on your network. Um, if this is malware that's, that has infected your network. So if we look a little farther down here, we see this move. Oh, okay, that was our buffer. Yeah, move zero into whatever that is. Leia edx minus one to eax compare eax with sixty five hex. Jump above down to well. That's the oh. This is the return. It jumps down here. It's above. Oh, that. That's weird. Okay, here we go. We're back in. So if it jumps to the return, if EAX is above 65 hex, and it goes down to this thing down here, how do we get it to go down to this thing down here? What's that? What's, what's that conditional mean? Where's the EAX coming from? The reference to EAX minus one, which is coming from this D word, looks like the socket. What is the D word? Well, if you go up before the directory, it looks like it's the top reference. The buffer reference. So let's say, let's name that. That's our received buffer. Now we named it, okay, so it's grabbing the, the received buffer. And the actual received buffer, not just so it, it offset pointer. So that's, that's the actual received buffer. So it's grabbing First four bytes of the received buffer. Subtracting one from that, so treating it like it's a number, subtracting one from it. Storing that result in EAX because a load effective address essentially gets rid of the dereference there. And we're comparing with 65 hex. So if it's going to jump down to the return, PAX is above 65 hex. That means it's expecting the first four bytes of the received buffer to be a, well, that'll be little Indian integer value of 66 or below, because it's doing that. So not only do we now know that, okay, maybe we're looking for packets of size 112 bytes, but packets of size 112 bytes were the first four bytes are um, 66 hex or below in little endian format. And then we see this down here. What's this? Better remember remember what this looks like in terms of uh, the intro RE class. What's going on? Is it yeah switch switch case? So it's taking the uh, the EAX and it's got a hey jump table there that's using. Yes, that's right. The things that were showed to you in intro RE are actually useful when you're analyzing real malware. Mm -hmm. This is real malware we're looking at. Whatever should it be. So it's using this jump table to decide where, where it's looking. So based on these, these different things, 
Free thread, start address, exit windows, shut down, exit process. Create thread. So, oops, it moved down. So, what can we say about the first four bytes? How 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 are those being used? Oh, maybe you might just not know the language. Um, so, command code. Where the first four bytes tell the this rat this is the command I want you to execute, and it translates that into, okay, I'm going to shut down the box, exit windows, if it's a, uh, what's that one, 2377, if we go over to here, the, yeah, well, we could figure that out. If it's a particular number, it'll shut down the box, um, and that doesn't mean the the attacker on the other end is entering a number into their keyboard. They're probably just clicking on something in the GUI and their their interface is sending that that number. So just from static analysis, we can make some assertions about what we might see on the network, feed that to the network folks and see if they see that. Not only that, but you had that you shut down privilege on there. Um, that will also show up in logs. In what? Logs. Yes, in logs as well. Assuming that. Right, assuming they do that. That they do that, yeah. So, additional information you can gather. And you can take this information and write up a nice little report on the, the C2 protocol. Trend Micro has released some good reports like that based off of analysis like this. So this this analysis like this is being done, is being reported, is being useful. Yay, malware. 